Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, as you can see on your screens, this is today's picture. It's a, a beautiful painting that's in the Russell Coates. Uh, and it's by uh, an artist who was greatly influenced by the pre-Raphaelites uh, by the name of John Brett. Now, if you look, um, first of all, at the white arrow, you'll see in the middle, lower middle of the screen, you'll see a, a ship which is just about to go under the waves. Uh, this is the subject, really, of today's talk. The blue arrow shows you a lifeboat which is pulling away from the sinking ship. And both of these elements, of course, are very small compared to the enormous sky and clouds you see and also, of course, the surging waves. Uh, I'd like you to take a moment just to have a look at this painting and make your own mind up, form your own impressions, if you will. I've pointed out two of the elements, but as you can see, it's a lovely, lovely sunrise. The clouds tinged with red, uh, you've got cumulus clouds uh, at the bottom uh, near the sea. Higher up, you've got cirrus. And in fact, behind the clouds and above the clouds, you have a lovely blue sky. Now, this is what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to tell you about the painting itself. We'll have a good look at that. I'm going to tell you about the reality of the sinking of the ship, which was called the SS London, the steamship London, bound for Melbourne in Australia from Gravesend uh, in England. And then finally, I will be telling you a bit, uh, all the information I've been able to get, in fact, on John Brett, the artist. So here it is. Christmas morning, 1866 is the title. It's by John Brett. It was painted in 1868, oil on canvas. And I would really recommend that uh, when this pandemic has been vaccinated out of existence, which hopefully will be soon, uh, we can all go into the museum, go into the Russell Coates, and walk into Gallery 2, where uh, on the east wall, you will find Christmas morning, 1866. In terms of dimensions, you've got a height of 151 centimeters. And in terms of width, it's 245 centimeters. Brett himself was 37 years old when he painted this. Now, as we look at it, it's fairly clear that two thirds of the canvas consists of sky and clouds. A third, the bottom third, is the sea and the waves. It was a gift of Sir Merton Russell Coates in 1921. 1921, of course, the year that Sir Merton Russell Coates died. Now, there are a number of anomalies associated with this painting. Uh, I'm going to introduce the first one now. The sky and the clouds, as you see them, were actually observed by Brett off the island of Anglesey in 1866. Uh, in other words, two years before he actually painted Christmas morning, 1866. The, the skyscape may have been done from memory or given the fact that he was as, far, as well as a painter, 
he was also a photographer. He may have photographed the sky and then used that. I found it interesting when I looked at this painting originally for, for the first time, it, it, it struck me as if, almost as if nature were mocking man. Uh, you've got a ship sinking, you've got a handful of survivors pulling away in a lifeboat, riding the waves. Uh, and it does seem to me anyway, of course you may feel differently, but I think the human tragedy is actually dwarfed by the immensity of the sea and the turbulence, uh, the immensity of the sky, sorry, and the turbulence of the sea. These are, of course, opposed factors uh, that we see in the painting. A lovely, beautiful pink dawn, and below it, a terrible and tragic event at sea. Is there an implicit message by the artist? Well, we will talk a little bit more about this later on, but I'd like you to consider that there may well have been an implicit message. Here is the painting again for you to look at it and take a, a moment just to study it. I think it's quite different, really, from any seascape that I've seen. You don't very often come across a painting where you see a sinking ship and a lifeboat pulling away from it. You have an accurate depiction of the sky and clouds and also the wave patterns. As I said before, these elements the sky and the sea, these elements represent about 99% of the painting. The sinking ship herself is tiny and in fact, the lifeboat and the survivors, not much bigger. A little bit of information about the SS London. Now, as you can see, she was a steamship you can see the funnel, uh, but she also had a great deal of sail. She was built in Blackwall Yard by Money, Wigram and Sons, launched on the Thames on the 20th of July, 1864. The GRT or Gross Registered Tons was 1,652. The crew on board the London was a crew of 90. On the first voyage to Melbourne, she left Gravesend on the 23rd of October, 1864, and arrived in Melbourne on the 2nd of January, 1865. She left Melbourne on the 4th of February, 1865, having spent just over a month in Melbourne. And she was carrying 260 passengers and 2,799 kilos of gold. She arrived in Gravesend on the 26th of April, 1865. Now the second voyage to Melbourne she left Gravesend at the end of May, 1865, and arrived in Melbourne on the 4th of August, 1865. Again, she spent a little bit over a month in Australia, left Melbourne on the 9th of September, 1865, and she was carrying, at this time, 160 passengers and 2,000 657 kilos of gold. She arrived in London in November of 1865. So in both cases, this is, uh, we're talking here about a six month return voyage. We come now to the third and final journey to Melbourne. 
The London left Gravesend on the 13th of December, 1865, under a Captain Martin, who was himself an experienced Australian navigator. On passing Perfleet uh, and observing the London, uh, a seaman uh, on the shore said, it'll be her last voyage. She is too low down in the water and will never rise to a stiff sea. But these turned out to be prophetic words. She was due to take passengers from Plymouth, uh, but she was caught in bad weather. And so Captain Martin decided to put into Spithead near Portsmouth. She arrived safely in Plymouth and left Plymouth on the 6th of January, 1866. She was carrying 239 passengers and crew and a very heavy cargo of iron and coal. Now, three days out, she was in the Bay of Biscay and she encountered a storm, very heavy seas. I'm sure some of you have traveled across the Bay of Biscay and you will know, uh, I suppose even if you haven't traveled uh, through it, we all know that the Bay of Biscay is famous for its bad weather. On this third day out, the January the 9th, the cargo shifts and the scuppers are choked. And this forces the vessel even lower in the water. Then huge waves pour water down the cargo hatches. At this point, Captain Martin decides to return to Plymouth. And this, in fact, was a fatal error of judgment. Why was it bad for him to decide to do this? Well, quite simply because he headed back straight into the eye of the storm. Here's a representation. If you look at the stars, they'll show you the route she was taking. Of course, she would have bypassed the Iberian Peninsula and headed down south uh, along the, the west coast of Africa and round across the Indian Ocean to, to Australia. On the 10th of January, the sea carries away the port lifeboat and then another wave carries away the jib boom, the four topmost, and main royal mast with all spars and gear. The next day, the 11th of January, a huge wave crashes on deck, smashes the engine hatch. As a result, water enters the engine room and extinguishes the fires. With the ship dangerously low in the water, the captain decides to abandon ship. Four lifeboats are launched, but three of them, tragically, are immediately swamped. When the only remaining lifeboat is 100 yards from the sinking ship, the SS London goes down stern first. And of course, this is what you see in Brett's painting. As she sinks, all those on deck are driven forward. And uh, this is a very poignant detail. The last thing heard from the doomed ship by the people in the lifeboat is the hymn, Rock of Ages, being sung. Then, according to witnesses, she is swallowed up forever in a whirlpool of confounding waters. As a result, 220 souls on the SS London are lost. There are 19 survivors in the lifeboat, 16 crew and three passengers. 
here's a painting uh, that appeared at the time, because don't forget, this, uh, the sinking of the London was a very big story at the time, reported in the media, in the newspapers, uh, both in Britain and in Australia. This is quite a good representation, I think, of what must have happened. And of course, there you can see parts, parts of the rigging are floating in the sea. The ship is tilting down, stern first. People on deck. It must have been an absolutely awful moment. And the one lifeboat pulling away. Please note the time of the sinking. This to me looks as if it were perhaps still at night. Uh, I'm not sure that that isn't moonlight reflected on the water. But the time of the sinking, I will ask you to bear in mind. Now here's a close-up view of the lifeboat that we see in Brett's painting. If you look at it, I'm sorry it's not terribly clear, but if you can if you can just give a quick look at that, you'll notice that there are only six or seven survivors in the lifeboat. And this, as you know, is not what actually happened. There were 19 in the lifeboat. But for his own reasons, Brett has chosen to represent only a, a very small handful of survivors. As I said, 19 survivors in reality, 16 crew, three passengers. They were lucky actually, because the lifeboat was almost swamped at one point, but they managed to bail it out. And on the, on the next day, the 12th of January, the 19 survivors uh, picked up by the Marianople and taken into Falmouth. Now here's another anomaly. In fact, the SS London did not sink on Christmas morning, 1866. She sank much earlier in the year on January the 11th, 1866. Brett has compounded the tragedy by setting the sinking on Christmas Day, which, as we all know, is a time of great happiness and family celebration. So there it is again. The ship disappears beneath the waves and a single lifeboat pulls away. Now, as I said, it was greatly reported in Britain is a poster which uh, is uh, announcing this terrible catastrophe, startling narrative, appalling catastrophe, the wreck of the steamship London. 220 colonists and emigrants lost and 19 souls are all that, that escaped. If you happen to go into Exeter Cathedral, you will see in there a plaque uh, to a gentleman called Arthur Corf Angel. He was an officer on the SS London and occasionally played the organ in Exeter Cathedral. The Board of Trade, um, when uh, they called a meeting to discuss the loss of this ship, the Board of Trade attributed two main courses for the loss of the SS London. First of all, as I said before, Captain Martin's decision to return to Plymouth. Uh, as a result, of course, he re-entered the worst of the storm. And secondly, she was greatly overloaded. 345 tons of railway iron and 50 tons of coal. The coal was stored on deck. This is why the scuppers were choked and water didn't flow off into the sea. All of these elements came together 
And of course, added to the iron and coal, which are in themselves very heavy, you had the human weight of 239 souls. We know that messages in bottles were found on the coast of the Bay of Biscay, I presume the French coast and the Spanish coast. One of them, in the moments before the SS London sank, D.W. Lemon wrote a quick note, put it in a bottle. The note said, the ship is sinking, no hope of being saved. Another passenger wrote, adieu, father, brothers and sisters, and my dear Edith, steamer London, Bay of Biscay, too heavily laden for its size and too crank. Windows stove in, water coming in everywhere. God bless my poor orphans. Storm not too violent for a ship in good condition. This I think is very important. The gentleman was making it clear that the ship was not in good condition. Incidentally, I'm sure you know this, but I'll say it anyway. Crank refers to a ship which rolls heavily and takes a long time to revert to the vertical position. Here's a, a painting of John Brett, who lived uh, from 1831 to 1902. He was born near Reigate, and he was the son of an army vet. In 1853, Brett entered the Royal Academy schools, but really he was much more interested in the ideas of John Ruskin and William Holman Hunt. Now, inspired by Hunt's ideal of scientific landscape painting, Brett visited Switzerland for inspiration. In 1858, Brett exhibited a painting called The Stonebreaker. This painting made his reputation. Here it is. Here is the Stonebreaker, a young boy breaking up stones, and these stones are going to form the foundation for a road. Great detail, as you can see, has been given to the vegetation, to the leaves, the flowers and plants all around. The Stonebreaker was greatly praised by John Ruskin. Uh, he advised Brett to travel to Italy and paint the Val d'Aosta, which Brett did. He exhibited the Val d'Aosta in 1859. Again, Ruskin was delighted and praised him greatly and actually bought the painting. Brett himself always stressed the scientific precision of his rendering of nature. This was very important for him. Here is the Val d'Aosta. It's in the Alps, right in the north of Italy. Uh, south really of the Swiss border and Zermatt, in case you know the area. I think this is a particularly lovely painting. He seems to have captured the magical element of this area. Beautiful detail, lovely colors. Now in later years, John Brett turned to coastal subjects and seascapes, uh, probably inspired by his ownership of a 210-ton schooner called Viking, which had a crew of 12 and on which he traveled the Mediterranean. I think this is significant because on these cruises, he would have had ample opportunity to study the waves and the motion of the sea, possibly even take photographs. 
And that's why in uh, his painting of Christmas morning, 1866, the movement of the waves, the movement of the sea is so beautifully done. Brett himself was a keen astronomer. He'd studied astronomy, in fact, since his childhood. In 1870, he was elected to the Royal Astronomical Society. He died in 1902, uh, aged only 71. Now, as a result of the loss of the SS London, attention was drawn to the terrible condition of the so-called coffin ships. They were called coffin ships because in many cases, the ships were more, worth more to their owners uh, if they went down, and presumably for insurance reasons, than if they continued to ply uh, their journeys and voyages across the seas. Seems extraordinary, really. The ships were not maintained properly, and as we've seen, greatly overloaded by greedy owners. I ask myself, of course, I have no way of knowing, were there enough lifeboats for 200 plus passengers and crew? Assuming 20, 25 to a lifeboat, at least nine or 10 lifeboats would have been necessary. We know, in fact, that even 60 years later, uh, the Titanic did not have enough lifeboats, as I'm sure you've seen if you've watched the, the film Titanic and even A Night to Remember with Kenneth Moore. Anyway, as a result of this terrible loss, uh, Samuel Plimsoll campaigned to reform shipping in order to avoid such disasters. Even so, it took a few years for uh, reforms to come into effect. So to summarize, I have this to say, given that Brett made fundamental changes to the reality of the sinking of the SS London, and that the ship herself in the painting is so tiny, literally uh, a couple of brush strokes, I do find myself perplexed. And in reaching for some sort of an interpretation, I've concluded that the disaster seems to be almost secondary in importance to the natural conditions of sea and sky. And of course, I ask myself why. Now, Brett was known to imbue his paintings with moral significance. Therefore, could he be telling us that although terrible human tragedies occur, especially when man is irresponsible, nature remains beautiful and indifferent. So to finish up, I would like to remind you of Brett's rather surprising alterations to the reality of the sinking of the London. First of all, the date is inaccurate. She sank on January the 11th, 1866, not December the 25th, 1866. The number of survivors is inaccurate. 19 were saved, not the six or seven as shown in the painting. And the time of the loss is inaccurate. The SS London sank when it was still dark, not as the day was dawning. The skyscape is, is also inaccurate. Uh, this wasn't a skyscape that uh, he would have uh, seen uh, in the Bay of Biscay, but rather 
he saw it uh, off, off the island of Anglesey. So I bring you the painting again so that you can have a look at it with more knowledge perhaps of the background and the detail. When you, when you do go into the museum, and I would urge you to do this, uh, in gallery two, you've got a comfortable seat you can sit on, you can study the painting. Notice how beautifully, I'm not sure if you can really see it uh, on your com computer screens, but when you stand close to the painting, you'll notice that at the bottom, the waves, he's managed to tinge the water very lightly with the red that you see or the pink in the clouds up above. I think it's beautifully done. It's, um, it's an extraordinary painting, quite unlike many, or quite unlike any, in fact, that I've ever seen, and well worth, as I say, going into the museum to see. Gallery two has, all the galleries have lovely paintings, but gallery two is particularly rich in all sorts of lovely Victorian art. In parting, I suppose, really, we must spare a thought for the 220 souls who perished. Diamonds were lost in the sinking of this ship. After the loss of the SS London, a gentleman called Frederick Chapman recorded in a monograph that he lost his mother, two brothers, a sister, and many friends in the tragedy. His mother had with her a mass of diamonds inherited from a relative such as he had never seen before. These diamonds are now at the bottom of the Bay of Biscay. Well, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now happy to answer any questions you may have.